Susan Sloan is a retired professional genealogist. I need my glasses for this. Whose area of concentration were conducting private lineage research and preparing lineage applications. She has authored articles in several genealogical publications in Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, and South Carolina. She holds Bachelor of Science and Master of Education degrees from Georgia State University. Susan is a member of seven lineage societies where she has served in various officer positions. At present, she is organizing president of the Colonel Daniel Appling chapter, United States Daughters of 1812. Honorary Regent and Treasurer James Edward Oglethorpe Chapter Daughters of the American Colonists and First Vice Regent of Thomas Wingfield Chapter Colonial Dames 17th Century. She holds the Office of State Historian for the State of Georgia Society USD 1812 and State Registrar um, the and State Registrar for the Georgia State Society Daughters of the American Colonists. Susan is a past president of the Georgia Genealogical Society and the Georgia chapter of the Association of Professional Genealogists. She's also a member of Georgia Professional Genealogists. Susan has given over 160 presentations and classes at 59 different venues, and we are incredibly pleased and proud to have her here today. Please help me in welcoming Susan Sloan to the Georgia Archives. Thank you. OK. Make sure that I can everybody hear me. Great. OK, well, I'm happy to be here. To talk with you about one of the one of my favorite men in our in American history, and that is the Marquis de Lafayette. In 1824, going back a few years now in history, the 50th anniversary of all things revolutionary was just around the corner. And as the nation prepared to celebrate the, uh, the, this milestone, the Congress thought it fitting to pass a resolution inviting the only surviving major general of the Revolutionary War, the Marquis de Lafayette, to be the nation's guest. The Marquis was delighted to get the invitation as his political life in France seemed to be over and he longed to see for himself uh, the fruit born on the tree of liberty, as he called it, that he had helped plant in America. James Monroe was president and had just issued the Monroe Doctrine. And he felt that Lafayette's presence on the golden anniversary of independence from Britain would be an appropriate exclamation point on his policy. The U.S. offered to fetch Lafayette in a Navy frigate, but Lafayette declined and booked passage on an American merchantman cargo ship for himself, his son, George Washington Lafayette, and his secretary, Auguste Lavasseur and his valet. Louis the 18th was angered by the invitation and would not allow for a suitable send-off for Lafayette when he left France. But the citizens of New York made up for it when Lafayette arrived there on the 24th of August, 1824. I mentioned the arrival of Lafayette in America as a snapshot of what happened all throughout his visit to America cities large and small, and even citizens of towns along the route that Lafayette was to travel came out to meet him and held events in his honor. In New York, ships jammed the harbor, guns boomed, church bells pealed, bands played, soldiers marched, and thousands of people lined the shore to cheer his ship as it went by. 30,000 met him in Lower Manhattan, and 50,000 waited up on Broadway to see the procession. But the scene as he left the ship was repeated many times over as old soldiers of the revolution came to see their general and friend. And we'll see if I can change the slide. Let's see. Whoop. Okay. Aha, there he is. 
Um, I'm going to quote from the book Lafayette by Giles Unger, as he says it so eloquently, and uh, it's in the book. I hope you will put this on your Christmas list or birthday list, whichever one is closest, so that you have a copy. And this is what he said. At the foot of the gangway, a group of veterans in patched up, ill-fitting old uniforms stood as straight as their crooked old limbs allowed. As he passed before them, each snapped out his name and company and the battle where he had served with the Marquis. Monmouth, sir. Baron Hill, sir. Brandywine, sir. It was all too much for the old man, and he burst into tears. Everywhere Lafayette went during his tour as America's guest, the old soldiers came out to pay their respects. Some waited all night in endless lines and pouring rain. At countless balls and parades and other events, old men of the revolution came up to him, weeping and kissing his hand, as each one asked him and, and as each asked one asked him if he remembered them from Brandywine or Monmouth or Yorktown or whatever battle or skirmish, he always answered yes. It's a wonder that Lafayette had the stamina to meet the hectic schedule of countless parades, banquets, receptions, and balls that the people had planned for him. Every day and into the night, they requested his presence, and he tried so very hard not to disappoint them. Women brought their babies for him to bless, and fathers led their sons into the past to touch the hand of a founding father. No matter when he arrived, the citizens greeted him with all their best efforts. At the approach to every town, militiamen and light fife and drum corps met him, his entourage, to escort them into town. He was an old man by now. He turned 67 just after he arrived and celebrated his, now some of us are past there, I know, I know. But back then, that was a ripe old age. He celebrated his 68th birthday before he went home, when he left for home in 1825. How did he do it? What began as a four-month tour stretched into 16 months. The triumphal procession took him to every state. Then we had 24 in the Union, and it covered some 6,000 miles. Let's see. Technology and I do not agree. But I, where did he go? Okay. What am I doing wrong? Would you come assist? Yeah, yeah I was trying to get it back over here to the, anyway. So see, it's on this screen up here. Oh. So yeah, <laughs> I have to move it all the way. Here it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> now come, I'm going to pass there. The that, that's his full name, by the way. Okay. You think you have a lot of names. He had a lot of names. Okay, okay. now. Okay, so I'm going to leave this here. All right, let's see. Okay. In the back, say they're having here. This is the this is the uh, book that some that uh, she just won, and I encourage you to put this on your Christmas list or whatever. But it is an excellent, excellent book, uh, researched in person in France. And there's Lafayette at war, and he arrived in New York August. 1824. I'm going to get caught up here in a second. This is what Lafayette looked like when he arrived. A little bit different from that fellow, that young fellow leading his troops. So, at everywhere Lafayette went, all along the traveled route, people came out to meet him. Even in Georgia's Indian Territory, settlers and Indians 
lined the creek banks to see him. Okay, and he, he toured the, when he landed in New York in August, the heat of the summer, he toured the Northeast in the fall of the year. He met with Adams and Jefferson, Mad Madison and Monroe, and other men of the revolution. And he visited the grave of his beloved friend, George Washington. Because the winter weather made travel impossible, he spent December, January, and February in the nation's capital, where he witnessed the most contentious presidential election of our nation's history. Now, I might argue with him about that now. This might have been written before some of our recent history. But anyway, um, so, and he saw his friend John Adams and John, John Quincy Adams elected friend, son of his friend John Adams, John Quincy Adams elected president. His travel schedule to the South and West resumed in March 1825. So in March 1825, he began his tour of the Southern states. See, I've done it again. She's gonna have to just stand here and do this. Right. <laughs> John, John says she doesn't know her left from her right. <laughs> Okay. All right. Now, Lafayette's visit to Georgia was a short one. It began on the 19th of March, 1825 in Savannah and ended in Coweta town on the banks of the Chattahoochee, which is near present day Columbus, Georgia on 31 March, 1825. See if I can. Aha. In the newspaper, the Macon Messenger, dated 9 March 1825, there's an article that's a letter to Governor Troop from Seaborn Jones, his contact with Lafayette, concerning when he would arrive in Georgia. Mr. Jones met with Lafayette and sent a letter to Governor Troop, dated 17 February 1825. And the letter lists Lafayette's itinerary. This letter was published in the newspaper. You know, the people back then, they, we didn't get, we didn't do all of this uh, electronic stuff. They put things in the newspaper if they needed to know something. And I think maybe some of you might be old enough that you remember back when I was a little girl, if we were supposed to dress a certain way for like a glee club thing or something like that, they would take a little, uh, safety pin or a uh, a clothes pin and pin and and tack the uh, instructions to our blouse you know you're supposed to wear a white skirt you know a white blouse and a blue skirt on a certain day to do certain things but back in these days it was the newspaper that gave you the instructions for what you were to do so this one is for the parents and guardians See, in the Savannah, Georgia newspaper dated Saturday morning, March 19th, appeared these instructions for parents and guardians to quote, the dress recommended by the teachers of the city to be worn by the children. For the girls, it was this, a plain white frock with short sleeves, looped with sky blue ribbon, sashes to correspond, long white gloves with a likeness of Lafayette, hair plain. How many of you know what hair plain is? <laughs> it means just plain, no ribbons, no anything like that. So anyway, for the boys, it was blue coats, coatees or jackets, white pantaloons, with Lafayette badges on the left breast. I see that even in the 1825 newspapers, folks had a problem with misplaced modifiers. I hope that the Lafayette badges were to be worn on the jackets and not their pantaloons. I'm not sure about that. So we know they got the message 
because Lafayette's secretary noted in his journal that, quote, the school children dressed uniformly and carrying baskets full of flowers that they scattered in the path of General Lafayette were a part of the ceremony, placing the cornerstone of the funeral monument for General Nathaniel Green that began at 9 a.m. on Monday morning, 21st March, 1825. Lafayette was a Mason and the ceremony was provided, pre presided over by the Masonic Lodge of Officers of Savannah. After the ceremony for General Green, the assembly moved to Chippewa Place, the location of the monument honoring General Pulaski, a great man of Polish birth who gave his life in the American cause. The ceremony placing the cornerstone for his monument was repeated in that place. Okay, let's see if I'm still. Okay. Also in Savannah on the morning of the 19th, 1825, were instructions to the Savannah Volunteer Guards and the Savannah Fencibles regarding the signal for them to take their way to the parade grounds to honor the nation's guest. And I'm going to quote from them. Attention, in conformity to regimental orders, the Corps will hold themselves in readiness to appear on their parade ground in complete uniform white, with white pantaloons upon a signal of two guns being fired in quick succession at the Chatham Artillery Laboratory to pay honors due to the nation's guest. Now, even, to, even instructions on where to pick up tickets to dinners and events were published in the newspapers, and everyone had their instructions now. All that was needed was for Lafayette to arrive in Savannah. Okay, and this is a, an invitation to a ball. Uh, that They had many balls that uh, everybody wanted to have a party for Lafayette. And many of them, and, and especially in Savannah, uh, when he got ready to leave, they still had a ball left for him on Monday evening, and he didn't get to go to that one. But uh, they had many, many of those uh, celebrations. Okay, so Lafayette had left Charleston on board a steamboat to make his way to Savannah. He arrived in Savannah on the 19th of March. And I want to read a portion of the newspaper article that welcomed Lafayette, as it tells us a lot about how the people felt about their guest. Oops, there he is. That's another picture of Lafayette. Okay. All right. This is what that says. This is what appeared Sunday morning, March 19th in the newspaper. This day, perhaps even before this sheet has met the eye of those who usually peruse it, the venerated Lafayette, a name with which is associated all that is glorious in chivalry, all that is lovely in virtue, all that is honorable in human nature, will have gratified thousands who have looked forward to his presence as they as the consummation of their anxious wishes. He needs he little needs our eulogy on those deeds, for they are engraved on the hearts of millions, those uh, whose unsullied fame is inseparably connected with the glory of our country and whose memory will be cherished as long as free principles and virtue have a habitation and a name. We can say no more. Let the joyous countenances, the palpitating hearts, the enthusiastic acclamations of a free and happy people this day meet to honor their benefactor, the friend beloved of the father of their country. Let's speak our welcome. Welcome, thrice welcome, the good, the gallant, the generous Lafayette. They really love this. Tell gives you a little bit of an idea of how much they really loved Lafayette. So Lafayette arrived in Savannah on Saturday, 19 March, 1825. He received visitors on Sunday, and the ceremonies dedicating the cornerstones took place on Monday. After the ceremonies were completed. On Monday, Lafayette had to leave Savannah 
to go to Augusta, 180 miles up the Savannah River. The preparations for the ball in Savannah that was to be held on Monday night were in vain, for the nation's guests had to leave their fair city. He boarded the, his steamship with the governor and others and headed up the river to Augusta. I think racing must be an inherited trait for men in the South. For as his, his ship approached Augusta with uh, Lafayette on, on board, two steamships loaded with citizens came out to meet them. They saluted the general and, and Lafayette's ship answered with cannon volleys and a lively rendition of Yankee Doodle played on their onboard orchestra. A race ensued between Lafayette's ship and the other two. And of course, Lafayette's ship won. <coughs> Lafayette stayed two days in Augusta, attending so many fets that his secretary records that he felt a fatigue for the first time on his trip. I must mention here that one of the le reasons Lafayette brought his secretary with him was so that they could record events and send information about the grand experiment of the United States back to Lafayette's friends in France. <coughs> At Augusta, they posted their dispatches for France before moving into the interior of the South. Lafayette left Augusta on March 25th on his way to Milledgeville. Then, of course, that was the capital of Georgia. He passed through Warrington and Sparta and spent the night at Warrington on the 25th. On March 28th, he arrived at Milledgeville, then the capital of Georgia. And among the festivities there was a ceremony at the State House where the mayor of Milledgeville, a man of French descent, addressed Lafayette. The secretary's journal comments on the beautiful gardens in Milledgeville, and I know they still have beautiful gardens. People go there to see the beautiful gardens in Milledgeville. The very next morning, he left Milledgeville for a trip across the country of vast wilderness to go to Alabama. On the way, they stopped briefly at Clinton, where Lafayette made an address from the courthouse steps and met once again the soldiers of the revolution who were there to shake his hand. The Masons of Sincerity Lodge tendered Masonic honors to Lafayette. He left Clinton and arrived in Macon, where he spent a short time there and was once again tendered honors, this time at Macon Lodge number 24. Lafayette left Macon and spent the night of the 29th of March at the old Indian Agency, an isolated building in the middle of a forest where conferences were held between the Indian chiefs and the U.S. government. Historical records of Macon in central Georgia, that's a, a book that's been written, says that he visited Macon on the 30th of March, 1825. On the second day of their journey from Macon, they were buffeted by a storm that caused them to seek shelter in a cabin in the woods. There's, and also there were Indians seeking shelter in that same cabin. They were in there drying their clothes by a large fire. This was Lavasur, uh, his secretary's first encounter with Indians, and he describes their time with them in detail. They left the shelter cabin and proceeded to a group of cabins to spend the night. At these cabins, they met a young Indian named Lafayette, La Lavasur. Later, he calls him Hamley. Hamley was educated in a college in the U.S., but later went back to be with his brothers, as Lavasur noted in his records. Hamley and Lafayette spent a long time talking, and one of the subjects that Lafayette asked him about was the, quote, late treaty with the United States. On this subject, Hamley became very angry and his, his rejection caused Lavasur to tremble, his reaction caused Lavasur to tremble at the dangers to the chief. That chief is the one that we know as McIntosh, who was later uh, murdered by the Indians near Whitesburg. 
which is in present day Chowita County. So that was part of the history that we still know was one that they saw firsthand. On March 31st, they left Hamley's camp and traveled to the banks of the Chattahoochee near present day Columbus, Georgia. It was here that they left Georgia for they were now in Alabama. And here, it was in this place they were met by Indians who greeted the General Lafayette warmly and entertained him with a game that from the description sounds like a cross between polo and football. One of the Indians was the oldest son of McIntosh and Lavasor remembered sadly the words of Hamley. Lafayette made his way to New Orleans and then took a restful two week steamboat drive uh, up the Mississippi uh, to St. Louis, where he then changed to a smaller boat for a trip to Nashville for he was finished with the his Georgia trip. But uh, his he um, in Nashville, he changed to an even smaller boat where he spent three days with the hero of New Orleans, Andrew Jackson at the Hermitage. So. I wanted to mention just one other thing, you know, there is a, um, uh, some people call it a um, a legend that Lafayette took soil from uh, Bunk Bunker Hill, Bunker Hill, and according to uh, to my book on Lafayette, he did visit Bunker Hill and he did take soil from the hill home with him. When he died in 1834, his son George Washington Lafayette made sure that American soil was put in his father's grave when he was buried at Picpus Cemetery in Paris. And I'll mention one other thing is, as Lafayette got ready to leave in 1825, it was just a few days before his birthday. And John Quincy Adams was now president and he insisted that Lafayette stay just a few more days for his birthday so that they could celebrate with him. So they agreed to have a birthday celebration. At the banquet held on his birthday, the familiar custom of making toasts commenced. It was common to have 13 formal toasts, one for each of the 13 original colonies. And usually presidents did not give a toast, but John Quincy Adams broke with tradition and raised his glass to honor his friend and he said, to the 22nd of February and the 6th of September, the birthday of Washington and the birthday of Lafayette, to which Lafayette replied, to the 4th of July, the birthday of Liberty. So now we've traveled with Lafayette through Georgia and mentioned some of the things that he did in the rest of his tour. And uh, I'm glad to say, sorry to say, we live, I don't know, we live in Fayetteville, Georgia. I think there was something like 600, okay, 600 uh, other places named for Lafayette. The first place was La uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. That he, he, in fact, he visited there when he, when he was here. Uh, but there are many others and you know them, uh, you know, Fayetteville, Georgia, Lafayette, there are a lot of different places named for him. About 600 have been named for him. Hamlets, uh, streams, rivers, everything named for Lafayette because the American people loved Lafayette. So uh, we continue to Lafayette when we stand for liberty and freedom as he did. Long may we do so. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Do you know where we, we stayed in Savannah? Uh prop I don't I don't know, but I'm sure it's recorded in the in this book. It's, I'm not I'm not sure. Check the who's got who's got the book. Check on that and see where it was. Yes. Did he visit Fayetteville, Georgia? He did not. Mm -hmm. Fayetteville, you know, Fayetteville, Georgia was founded, uh, Fayette County was founded in the 1827 lottery. 
21 lottery, 1821 lottery. And we were farther north from there. I suspect that the folks who had planned his trip uh, were the ones in Savannah were in charge of that. I suspect they probably did not. Uh, it wasn't. It didn't fit into their their uh, their plans for him to come to Fayetteville, Georgia. So he did not come that far up. He and I've got I have a map over here with uh, little sticky doos as to the places where he went. And he went up to uh, Augusta and came back down to Macon and then down to Columbus area. So he did not he did not visit Fayette County or uh, Fayetteville, Georgia. Yes. One of their little tools mm -hmm. that they did show a, a house where he stayed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I know it's probably, and you may be able to. Oh, this is where I want to mention the American Friends of Lafayette. Um, they will have it on their tour, but uh, and it'll be in that book. And you may be able to just look up online. Where did Lafayette stay in in Savannah? I don't know the exact place, but um, I encourage I encourage you to uh, take a look at the little handout. is just an application for you to join a society called the American Friends of Lafayette. They are planning an, a reenactment of his entire uh, tour of the United States, and um, they are. It's a wonderful organization. I've already joined, of course. I couldn't wait but uh, to join. But they also have a lot of information about where he stayed, and they have researched. You know, there are a lot of places that say Lafayette slept here, and they have they, some Lafayette could not have slept in all of those places. But uh, and sometimes it's just a, a something that they want to believe that he stayed there because this house is named for him or his you know son or whatever. So uh, but anyway, but they have researched all of the places where he did stay, and they have documentation that when he was there and what happened when he was there, because they have read the uh, there's a book that from um, that was take has taken his secretary's notes and has listed, you know, has uh, printed that out. So they know all of those things. So um, so I recommend that you check out their website, that you join their society, and uh, you get a nice little pen that looks like this. And uh, this, but anyway, but they're wonderful people. And they are, they have a, they have someone who is, uh, re, they're reenacting it with an actor who will play Lafayette at all of the different places. Uh, that he was, and they have a period. They have period coach. They have a period. You know, they're going to do exactly where he went and when, and on the exact days that he was there. So I think it's a, it's very interesting that, and it's important to get the right information because we have a lot of people who say, well, the name of our, you know, uh, the name of our town is named for Lafayette, so he had to stay here, you know, at some point. But he didn't. So she's got something. What have you got? Well, I looked it up as um, the Owens Thomas House. Okay. Where he stayed in Savannah. The Owen Owens, Owens Thomas, Thomas House. Completed in 1819, a posh and posh Oglethorpe Square. Okay. Thank you. See, all we need is a phone <laughs> and know how to do it. Yes. <laughs> Even though his stops along the way were, were beautiful, enjoyable, the journey itself uh, along what we know as the old federal road could not have been no. constantly pleasant. Did his secretary make note of that? Yes, I think he did. He said he was exhausted and the tr and it, you know, the carriage would bang, bump, you know, and uh, so it was it was a hard journey for a 68, 69 year old man at that time. Yes, but that book is wonderful that, that has his, it's about this thick and has little bitty mice type. So I know there's lots of good information in there. I have not read that entire book. I wanted to read the Unger book first, the one that I just gave away, but uh, the one by Harlow Giles Unger. He uh, went to France and the family allowed him to use their records in France to uh, to write his book that he wrote. And a lot of the times, the books that are written by American authors 
are based on um, English translations of books that were written in France. But the people of France hated Lafayette, the, the, uh, the elite in France are the ones that would have been writing. So they did not, they would not have had a, a, a good outlook, a positive, they wouldn't have given a positive uh, idea. You know, so uh, so I like I like the fact that he used the exact he went to uh, France and then, then the family allowed him to use their records and their information to write this book about him. And uh, so, uh, you know, that's that's my I just and this book is really wonderful. I'm, I want to sit down and read it again. I've read it several times, but it is absolutely wonderful. And he says things so eloquently um about and he gets and he, he says you know funny things at times and there are also some uh, some things that are really uh heart-wrenching you know that that and the life the life that Lafayette lived and his wife Adrian you will have a new appreciation for Adrian Lafayette she was absolutely uh she was the really uh, you know how it is. Women are always the ones in charge of the household. You know, but uh, but he she did have pay a big part in getting their uh, French their um their property and all of that back after the French Revolution. She was the one that spearheaded that and did that kind that kind of thing. She went when he was in prison in Olmutz, and she lived. They lived there with their two daughters in prison, and she ruined her health actually because she died. Not too long after that, you know, uh, because she had it was such an ordeal the way they were treated in in prison. So but anyway, but I, I recommend the book by Unger and uh, it's once you read it, you will have a new appreciation for uh, the Marquis de Lafayette and what he meant to this country uh, and our liberty. Yes. Do you remember if he was at the Battle of Germantown? Yes, he was, I think. Yes, I think he was. Because my fourth great grandfather, John Gritton, was at Germantown and Monmouth mm -hmm. under uh, Washington. Yes, I believe yeah, so he, he was. was I believe he was Lockton there. Lockton also. Lockton yeah. Was wounded at Brandywine, which was. Like he was, Lockton. Lafayette was wounded at Brandywine. Brandywine. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's just so much. I just, I, I love Lafayette. You can't tell, can you? <laughs> <laughs> and each, uh, our, we're in, in the DAR that's in Fayetteville. Each uh, August, we have a Lafayette dinner and we have a, do a program uh, based, you know, some, some little something, snippet, snippet that we can do about 20 minutes have dinner and honor Lafayette. We tried doing it, his birthday is September 7th, I think, 6th or 7th. And uh, we tried doing it then, but it just didn't with Labor Day and all of that, we just couldn't get it together. So we do the fourth the fourth uh, Tuesday in August in uh, every week, every year. And in, in, uh, our DAR chapter sponsors that. So it's something you can do locally just to honor Lafayette. Once you read that book, you will want to you will want to do that. Yes. Do you have any relationship with Napoleon? Napoleon, I don't think so. Uh, John says it's a love. It was a love hate relationship. Okay. <laughs> Napoleon, I think. Turn around. Thank you. Napoleon. Sort of didn't know what to do with Lafayette. Uh, Lafayette was popular with some people, but uh, I think one of the Lafayette's sons actually served in Napoleon's army in one of the, one of the wars. Still, mm -hmm. they, they kind of held each other at arm's length. <laughs> from what I understand. Okay. okay. So the trouble of Lafayette with the French is the, the nobles. Didn't like him because they thought he was a Jacobin, and the Jacobins didn't like him because he was a noble. <laughs> so he just couldn't win. <laughs> All right. I think we're done. Where's that young lady that introduced me? There she is.
Everybody, please give Susan a round of applause. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what we have coming up for the archives. Our next lunch and learn is Tony Barnhart. He's got a book, The 19 of Green, so he'll be talking about his book. That's April 12th. Uh, we do still have our exhibit on downstairs um, from Gavel to Archive, where we talk about some of our legal cases um, that will only be up till April 6th. So that'll be gone by the next lunch and learn. So take it, um, the advantage of that while you're here. We also just put the um, program or flyer up for our April 6th history symposium. It's the 150th anniversary of the Georgia Department of Agriculture. So the topic will re revolve around that. But that is also up on our website, which is georgiaarchives.org. I'll try to have Ms. Sloan's uh, presentation up on our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to go back and take a look at anything um, and also please don't forget to take a look at our Facebook and Instagram pages. So we'll promote all of these upcoming events there as well. So thank you everybody for coming today. Please feel free to stay and chat. <laughs>